Welcome to The Passion Pod with your host, Chris Johnson. Thanks for joining us. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the feature presentation. Season 8, Episode 8. Welcome back, friends. Today we're sitting in Hollywood, Los Angeles. I was walking down the uh, the really dirty uh, Hollywood Boulevard last night to get pizza, um, and then all of a sudden I walk up the street and I'm in this hotel where I feel like everything's fancy and clean again. Um, today we welcome to the show a very, very eclectic and unique in- individual, originally from New Jersey, who transplanted out here to LA like most people. He does music, he produces, directs. He, I mean, he does like a lot of stuff, so I guess I'll, I'll let him explain it, but welcome to the show, Sam. Santino the Misfit? Is that what you go by? Santino the Misfit, Campanelli, Santino the Misfit, previously Santino Noir. I don't know, man. It's like, I, I can't, just like the things I do, I can't seem to keep my name straight. Uh, it's, uh, I'm all over the place. But it's yeah, a, Santino the Misfit, Campanelli. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a constantly evolving situation it, with it, you. Not anymore. I'm done. I'm done changing it. Don't hold me to that, but I'm done changing it. As far as, as of right now, it's solid. <laughs> For the time being. Okay, so in your own words, who are you and what are you passionate about? Uh, I am a musician and filmmaker. Um, those are the two main things that I spend a lot of my time on. But as far as I'm concerned, since I jump all over the place, I just like to make cool stuff with cool people. Yeah, dude, creating. That's really what it comes down that's to. It. People ask me all the time, like, what are your goals with the show? Yeah. And my goal is to inspire people. Like, that's really the point. Sure. But like, really, when they're, they're, they're asking me more financials, and really, all I tell them is like, look, I want to be financially free to create things. That's, that's it. That's the ticket right there. Is being financially free to create things. That's that. That is the perfect summary of like what's your goal. Mm-hmm. I just want to make the things I want to make with who I want to make them with, where I want to make. That's it. I just want to be able to just take this thing that's in my head and put it into the world in whatever form that takes. Yeah, without it have to be dictated by somebody else in any kind of way, whether it's ad revenue, whether it's you know whatever. There's a lot of things that come into play. Sure. But being able to just make stuff. Like, or and, and just the sometimes these things require the funding just to be made, even if there are no other cooks in the kitchen. It's just the the undertaking, you know. Well, I mean, yeah, it's expensive to live out here, but in, in comparison, <laughs> right? I live in Wisconsin; it's cheap. But I also have two kids and stuff. Yeah. So like, I have I have a house and everything to pay for, and I get the question fairly often of like, well you know, how much is this, whatever, whatever. And they're like, well, I thought you just do it because you're passionate about it. And I'm like, I do, sure. but you, you know, there does, it, there is a cost of living Absolutely. attached and I'm not rolling up in a crazy fancy vehicle everywhere I go either. Like I'm keeping it relatively cheap, but sure. it is expensive to be able to create anything for me to fly out to somewhere like LA rather than just interviewing people in my hometown, which I do interview people in my hometown. And I love doing that too. Yeah. It's expensive to come out here. You no, know, abs- even when I got two other friends in, in the room with me to try, like share in bed so that way we can make this thing cheaper. Yeah. It's still, yeah, it's no, still sh- expensive. Sharing to is the like when I because so I, I lived in New Jersey, um, but then I moved to Manhattan for years. I was in New York City for a while. And uh, it's same with here. You can't live out there without roommates and without certain things that only in those places, like they're, they're, they're concessions in most places, but like there's just like, no, this is just the way you live. Like you don't have a car in New York City, like stuff like that. Just like you cut these odd things, you know what I mean? You just do whatever you need to do and find all the resources and everyone pulls them together and you're all hopefully working towards the same thing too. Like I've lived with other musicians and stuff. Uh, and it, yeah, it's just because otherwise the cost of living out here is just insane. And same with New York. And, and forget about it, in New York, what you get, you get like a shoebox for like three grand, you know, like if you're anywhere downtown, it's crazy. Yeah. Well, I mean, and it's, it's just a different lifestyle too. The people who are out here doing what you're trying to do, they're not family people and you can't keep up if you are because we're not talking 40 hours a week worth of like sure. working, right? You're out here specifically to grind and get done to establish yourself and like create all these things but it's a it's all day yeah. right like even when you're going out it, you are trying to make friends but it's usually intentionally being around the right kind of people too. putting yourself out there in a way yeah. of like networking but in you know in a way that's still enjoyable and you are making friends but it is still work like yeah. you are still doing it very intentionally you're not out here just to like mess around no I, I i joke about it a lot it's uh going out to places when you know you have like a purpose to go out which feels like work it's it, it feels like work until like the third drink <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's and definitely then, one way to work you know what i mean yeah, and then yeah. as soon as and it and depending on who you end up meeting with and how that sure. goes because sometimes those things uh turn into now now i'm enjoying myself now this is a good time i forgot like what my end goal here was, which is a very LA thing. Like I'll come out, I need this from this person. So I'm going to be there for that reason. And that's it. 
Um, whereas I, back east, it wasn't as as prevalent. People just be like, no, I'll come out just because I'm coming for you, yeah, not because I need something from you. Yeah, well, um, I mean, it's different. People, there's, there's. I tell people here, like when I, I go back home and people ask me about, about the vibes and stuff, and I'm sure. like, it, you know, it is aggressive. It's very aggressive. It is very cutthroat, and it's not. Be, I think it's it's the environment, right? It's not because people want to have to do that it's just simply like you have to that's the yeah, only way that you're going to be able to do right exactly sure. it's just people need to be productive to be able to pay their rents and stuff you know Absolutely. you go back home where like i'm from there's sixty five thousand people there is no competition there and uh, there if i went out it's unlikely i'm going to run into somebody that's going to have any significant effect on my career anyways yeah. so there, it's but i'd also don't need it because you know my house was one hundred seventy thousand dollars. A, that's a four bedroom house, <laughs> half an acre. That's insane. Yeah, dude. That's, that's what, but that's what it costs. You yeah. know what I mean? It's just a totally different lifestyle. And a lot of people come out to places like this in New York or whatever to establish them, themselves and pursue the things they're trying to do that they can't where they're from. And then once they get to a certain point, they end up wanting to settle back, you know, somewhere quiet anyways. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. just that time of your life that you're trying to do this stuff. So let's get back to where you're from. You're from New Jersey. What, what was it like growing up? What kind of town was that? And I know your first like time in music was screaming in bands and stuff, right? So can you tell yeah. me like growing up how you even got into that? Sure. Um, I, uh, so I started out in, um, um, I was in Tom's River, New Jersey is when I got into music. That's where I went to middle school and high school and all. And that's kind of when it kind of really caught me. I had always wanted to be in a band before that, but like I didn't know anything. I took like a couple guitar lessons. I was terrible. And I was like, well, this is never going to happen. Approximately I, how big of a city is that? Like how, how many kids in your high school type situation, I guess? That's a good question. I don't know. A couple thousand maybe. In uh, the high school? I, I, I I honestly don't know. It's okay. a big, it's a big school, and there's three high schools in the town, and I mean, it's a, it's a big town. I mean, oh, it I, is. Okay. I, someone told me once if the there's an old railroad that hasn't been functioning since I lived there, but if it if it was functioning, that would be like the last thing hurdle they needed to be considered a city. Oh, okay. Apparently, but it's it's still very like blue collar and flat. It's not like when you picture a city, you know, sure. like skyscrapers and that kind of thing, and it's all sure. very spread out. Uh, but it's a big town, um, and uh, yeah, no. So I started out. Uh, 2001, I I think I my first show uh, was how, in Stone Pony. Uh, Thirteen. How How old are you now? I'm sorry. Uh, Thirty four. <laughs> you gotta think about it, right? I'm 31, I always, and I, yeah. I think about it too. All the time. Okay, so as it's soon the same... as you crack 30, it's like, uh... yeah. So we're on the same on that same general time sure. frame of growing up. Okay, so you're 13 by the, for your first show. Was My this like a high show. school, like no, at the school thing? No, where... I I opened a show at the Stone Pony, which is like a like a legendary venue back like Bruce Springsteen, Bon Jovi, oh, all that cool. stuff. And um, it's in Asbury Park, New Jersey. And uh, this band, Divinity Destroyed. I uh, I had been kind of jumping into the music scene like by being a mall rat sure. and and just finding you know people that's where i met everybody and got flyers to free shows nearby and wherever i could walk to i would go or wherever my my parents who were inc incredibly like either really 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 supportive or just yeah go don't be in the house making all this noise uh it was one or the other um but uh yeah i would go to shows everywhere and the singer of that band um i just asked like hey i started this band in with a bunch of kids that i go to school with uh, people i wasn't friends with before either i only met them because i was looking actively for people to start a band with and uh, yeah, we, he said sure, and he let us open his show. And um, one of the last big shows, I, one of the last shows I played in Jersey is actually headlining that same venue, which I've done a bunch of times since. And sure, um, but uh, it's been that's been like the maybe one of the few constants since I started music is that venue. Sure. Well, I'm sure it holds a special place in your heart a little Absolutely. bit because of that. You know Shout what I mean? Shout out to the so, Stone Pony, Asbury Park. That's what I'm saying. Well, as, and as you grow and you know you can do things to give back a little bit to the space Absolutely. itself, it's like you want to be doing those types of things. I, not to completely divert, but sure. the last big show I did with my band Scarlett Carson back there, uh, the opening act we booked, I met at the same mall I started at. He worked at the Hot Topic there. That's ridiculous. And I met, when I was promoting that show, sure, and sure. I just I was like, yeah, what are you, what are you doing? What's your band? I said, I listened to him, hit him up. Up. It's like come open the show, and it was awesome. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's a smaller world than people think, Absolutely. especially when you all of a sudden go into kind of like niche like spaces. Yeah. You know what I mean? Niche friend groups, niche industries. There's yeah. really not that many people involved. So N not not ones that make uh, enough noise for like you and I to know at some point. Like once you yeah. get to a certain echelon, it's like everybody knows everybody. Yeah, yeah. There's just not that many people in the space. I yeah. mean, you can you you actually could follow follow them all on Instagram and see their things. There's not yeah. that many people, which <laughs> is like kind of rad because then like. Like nowadays, I've established a little bit of a network out here where I can kind of just send out messages and texts in texts or DMs or whatever to people I've interviewed. 
and like finding interviews isn't that hard, right? Because everyone has friends. And if, as long as you're honest and hardworking and you're doing a decent job, then people are happy to help out and be involved with you. You know, it's because you went out and had a drink with a couple of them yeah, just for this specific intent of like, who do you know? And all no, I'm yeah. no, no, but I mean, it's that, partially true though. But no, it really I'm, is. Like, and I, I never knocked the hustle. I'm only, I'm only joking. I never sure, knocked the hustle. It's, sure. it's a matter of tact, I think, with everybody. Well, like you said, it's not about it's as long as you're not doing it in a malicious way. Yeah. If you're really looking, and I tell people, I give people, people ask me for business advice all the time, and I always sure. tell them the same two things. And I've said it before. First one is you have to be able to sell yourself as a solution to somebody's needs. That's it. It's, yes. You don't have to sell a product at all. If they think you're the one to help with this problem, you're, you're going to be super successful in everything with that. The second thing is anyone will work with you if you can identify whatever the mutually beneficial situation is. So that's where we're talking about not being malicious. It's, yeah. it's going, okay, well, I have these tools, these skills that I can help somebody with. I need help with this. If you can identify how you can actually help that person, they're gonna want to work with you as long as you're not a jerk. Yeah. You uh, know. Although, although, and as I'm sure you know, especially in like the entertainment industry and stuff, you can be a huge jerk, and still, if you, you know, if it's beneficial enough for the person on the other side yeah. of that exchange, they'll put up with way more than they should ever have to. Which I, you know, we've all had to eat crow, so to speak. So. Yeah, but uh, but I, w- I would say the more successful people I've met. I was surprised by how nice most of them are. And then it, it made sense with me after like I thought about it more and it was like, wait a second, people wanna work with people they enjoy working with. That's probably part of the reason they got to where they are is because people liked working with them over the years. I and f- sometimes people get jaded and whatever else happens. I but. find it's the gatekeepers that tend to be the ones who have more of the attitude issues that sure. I've dealt with, not the people that made it through the gates. Sure, sure. You know what I mean? Like yeah. people who, have, who can allow the power over over you and, and, ta- and take advantage of it. And we, we've seen no shortage of that happening in yeah. many, many spaces. So, sure, yeah. sure. Okay, so getting back to it, you, you grew up in New Jersey. You started playing. This was like high school all of a sudden you're playing. Can you explain kind of the years of like it, it growing, I guess, your, your music career through yeah. then and then into the time frame of you coming out here? Yeah. Uh, oh <laughs> How long is this show? Yeah, exactly. Um, no, uh, sh- short version. Um, I was in that band. That band was called Cultivate the Grave. We did the Pony, uh, played a bunch of shows in the area and stuff. That lasted for about a maybe a year or so. Um, then it kind of evolved into another thing with different people, um, called Defire. And I did that for years. We did shows at like Birch Hill and stuff, which was another big venue back in the day, um, in New Jersey. And that was when I started to kind of get a taste of playing with some big national acts and all. Like we did uh, a couple shows with like bands. I don't know if you remember like, uh, Kitty and Head PE and all these dudes from back. And it was like just really, really cool bands. And I was really into, um, way back when. And, uh, that's when I was like, oh, I can like, I'm actually getting to a certain level. Maybe I should really uh, take this a bit more seriously. And uh, that's when I decided to, you know, lose a lot, a lot of weight. I was about 300 pounds in uh, in high school, and I dropped about a buck and change, I think, at one point because I, I kept joking. I was like, "How many fat rock stars do you see around?" You know what I mean? Like, it's how not, old were you at that point in time? Uh, I was probably a junior. I think I was a junior going into my senior year of high school, so like 17, 16, 17. Oh, sure. So this was before you ever moved out here or anything. Oh, you, yeah. You I didn't. Saw... I, I, I've only been out here. So Five six years now. Oh wow! So I got okay. here in my late twenties. I did a lot of the everything else back in Jersey and then New York City after that. Um, but yeah, I uh, so I started those bands and then um, I wasn't. I was finding a lot of friction with band members at the time. Uh, I think I might have been a big cause of it. I'm very much a like we need to do this. We got to get this done. This is the way we're doing this. Like, and I didn't. Speaking of tact, I didn't have a lot of it when I was that age. I just, I, in my mind, I was like, no, this is the, this is going to work. This is, this works. That works. Let's just do that. And like, sure. why are we fighting about it? Like, we all know this is going to work, and and it would. And but people don't like being told what to do. They want to be, you know, part of it. And I didn't even dawn on me that I was like telling people what to do. I was just trying to do what was good for the band. Yeah. And then once I realized uh, to calm down and stuff, I I started working with people again. But I ended up doing a solo project then, and that's when I first started doing hip hop. Uh, cause my cousin Luke, uh, he passed away when I was 16, um, and we went to his, uh, we went down to his house in uh, South Florida for the funeral. And we found his last lyrics were sitting on uh, his dresser, and uh, I, I had introduced him because I used to live in Florida, to have moved a lot, but um, I introduced him to the guys he was recording with at the time. So I went in and I had never rapped a, like a word in my life. I couldn't even sing at this point. I was just screaming everything and trying to sing very poorly. <laughs> trying a lot though. Um, and uh, I, uh, yeah, I, I, we recorded his, I wrote one song with this kid Gust and my buddy Alex who uh, recorded everything. And, uh, and then I recorded his last lyrics. And then 
kind of on the side while I was doing the band thing, just kept doing hip hop stuff, like from just for me. I, I don't I don't know what that was. It was I guess my way of uh, dealing with grief or coping with it and stuff is just finding a creative outlet. But I knew the sh wasn't any good. Sorry, uh, I know it wasn't any good. So I uh, I wouldn't, wouldn't dare release it. It'll never see the light of day. Um, but I just kept doing it, kept doing it, kept doing it. And then um, once the band thing fizzled out, I was like, hmm, this is, I think, my senior year. And I was like, let's just uh, try it. And I put out a they, the whole thing was they gave me a bunch of uh, grief for my attitude. So I leaned into it and started a solo project called Godly, G-O-D-D-L-E-E. -E. Oh, and I the, called the brilliance. Like I was just like, all right, you want to call me like, the, you know, you think I'm think I'm too arrogant. Let's let's lean into it and see if this gets everyone kind of talking about it. I was trying to be, you know, a marketer at the time. Sure. Uh, that did that did not play out. Um but uh yeah so I mean but but that kind of started that and um I moved to Florida for a while, uh went through what I call my normal phase where I wasn't in a band. I was wearing stuff from like PacSun. I didn't have any <laughs> piercings or anything. I I it was just I maybe my ears and not no gauges or anything I do now and then I did that for like a year or so, and I was like, no, I can't. I absolutely cannot do this. This is not working for me. So I started working on music again. I pierced my eyebrow, my lip, my gauged my ears, started getting the, the sleeve started, tattooed my hands before almost anything could even show through a sleeve <laughs> just to make sure that this is what I was doing. Um, and uh, yeah, I moved back to Jersey, started Scarlet Carson, and I did that for about seven years, six or seven years, and that was probably one of the biggest things I've had the good fortune of doing. Um, and that was a, we're a hard rock band. We're still, we, we broke up for quite a while and that's, that's a whole other story, but short version of that, we were together for about six, seven years. I think from like 2006 to 12, somewhere around there. And uh, we started out, you know, smaller venues and worked our way up to headlining Starland Ballroom, which is a pretty big venue back in Jersey, but I think at 3,000 cap or something like that. Uh, we've played with, you know, we played with Papa Roach, Fuel, Buck Terry, Motley Crue, Vince Neil, like name a band that was prevalent at the time. We either opened for them or played direct support for Papa Roach, which was awesome, and Vince Neil. Um, so we did some cool stuff, played a bamboozle at Giant Stadium a couple of times, uh, won some big contests, yada, 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 did all that. And then um, I fell into old habits, it seems, and <laughs> they didn't like, things were working, things were working really well. And I wanted to come out here, though, because they weren't continuing, we kind of hit a, a, a ceiling like, right. out there, like, plateaued. And I wanted to come out to L.A. because we were doing, you know, I'm, I think we did 12, you know, collectively with all the acts in the bill, but we were like 1,200 people for a local show that I promoted was like, you know, if I did that here in L.A., yeah. if I put 800 people or whatever, which was, that, that would have packed the House of Blues with a line out the door. Right. Like, had I done that here, we'd have had at least a, a manager or an agent or a label or some, sure. something. So we had nothing. We were doing everything completely independent, funding everything ourselves. I was our web designer, social media marketer, graphic designer, you know, pr pr I did handle print, uh, and we had our buddy Jeff Wallace who mixed all our stuff, and that was it, man. We started tracking his stuff originally in his mom's garage. Like, that's, you know, we just did sure. everything super, super, uh, um, you know, indie, uh, grassroots and all that with our fans and everything, and that was it. And uh, so I started my solo project again, but that was under Santino Noir, and uh, that's when I moved to New York City, and, and that was a hip hop thing again? That was a hip hop project. And uh, the reason I actually didn't come out here immediately after the band is because I, I was going to. I found a place downtown LA. Uh, I, I, the band thing was, was fizzling. I wanted them to come. They wouldn't do it. And I was like, well, we're, things are, I can see this going downwards. Like, let's, sure. we got to make a move here and we're not getting any younger. Um, but then Hurricane Sandy came and hit and uh, totally like just wiped out my parents' house. It, it destroyed the damn thing. I mean, it was salvageable ish but it was a whole that was a whole episode and um we had some other family stuff going on and also i didn't want to be that far away from them um yeah. so i stayed nearby and moved to new york city instead sure. i was there for about three four years uh what was different years. about the the hip-hop thing at that point than time because the first thing that you dropped was like very much leaning into arrogance so how was it different the second time around i i i so the uh the first time i always kind of had this um attitude of if someone's giving you crap about something, take away the power from them by just embodying it. And not, I'm, not necessarily, I'm not saying that's necessarily a good 
way to handle all things, but like even when it came down to when I was uh, a freshman in high school, I went from eighth grade to people because I was a heavy set kid. I, I, you know, I was wearing like West Coast toppers, t-shirts and denim vests and like, you know, big baggy jeans and just kind of was, you know, regular looking doofus who was a big chunky kid. And I, but I, st I was really tall. Uh, I was always pretty big for my age, especially uh, at that age, comparatively to everyone on my classmates. So I just stood out and I was just like kind of odd. So it was always an awkward thing. And I'm, I'm a loud, goofy, try to crack jokes every chance I get. And I talk back to everybody if I don't agree with them. Like I don't shy away from a, from a good, a good, healthy debate, we'll say. Yeah. Um, but uh, I said, oh, if I'm going to be the focus of attention, I went into freshman year. I literally just showed up over the summer. I had like blood red hair and it looked like I raided a hot topic. <laughs> like I had the full like, ga I think there were gasps or something. Like uh, just like the piped glow in the dark pants and a mud bean t-shirt with the big ball chain necklace and the black other trunks. French coat. I would wear white out contacts like Manson to school. People thought I was going to eat them. They've literally walked up to me <laughs> after the fact and be like, I thought you were going to either shoot up to school or eat me. Like, oh, God. That's, yeah, it was just yeah. so I just, but I said, oh, screw it. The attention's sure. on me. And if like, because I, I felt really uncomfortable about it and I was really self-conscious. I was like, well, then let's just, now I know why they're looking at me. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I kind of, that was kind of a control thing. Yeah. And the same thing with the music it was like, well, they're saying this about me, at least in my circles. So like, well, now I know why they're saying it because I said it. Yeah. You know, I'm not saying that's necessarily a great way to handle yeah. it, but it worked for me at the time. Whereas the new stuff, uh, when I segued into the solo stuff again, it wasn't about that. It had become my whole life had completely changed. I was older and all, and everything sure. I did was pretty singularly focused on being successful in music. So a lot of the music was about that and everything I went through with the band and just trying to figure out my place in in as being a creator in this sure. crazy industry and stuff. Because the more I learned about it, the more both it, it's it's a weird thing to like find these glimmers of success in these little um, little moments of like oh this this might be it this might be it and then, but the, once that keeps happening it does two things it it makes you feel like oh this is totally doable and then at the same time makes it feel even further away like this is even harder now because like well if that didn't do it sure but also but they but they but you know but I did this thing like I did this great thing so somebody gave enough of a crap to let me do it and people came and everyone liked it so keep going but then like well why did that equal x y and z why didn't this get from you know one spot to the other uh yeah so and then anyway so that's what the music and, and hip uh, the hip-hop stuff kind of became about that um and i and i kind of stopped trying to be um edgy Sure. I just started doing whatever opportunities came my way. I did a song with one of the Real Housewives in New Jersey, uh, Melissa Gorga. We did a music video. It was on Entertainment Tonight. I opened up a show on a floating stage in a lake in in Florida for the Jonas Brothers. Popped out on, on during the set with her for like the some Fourth of July fireworks thing called. It was called Red <laughs> Hot and Boom. One of the weirdest experiences in my life too. It was it was cool, but it was just like surreal. Like I was staying when I was out there for the show, they put me up at uh, Johnny Wright's compound, and he was the guy who did like um, Britney Spears and all them. So like the locker okay. from Hit Me Baby was like on the walls. It was just weird. I'm one of the only people in the building except for a couple like studios. This huge place. It was just it was weird. All of it was weird. And there was people you know they had like choreographed dancers, and I had come from like. You know, metal into yeah. hard rock and uh, and all that stuff. It's like pop is so not my thing. And I wrote this thing overnight for her, and it's kind of snowballed. And so that was you know. Yeah. But I would just throw it throw it everywhere, and that kind of became my thing, and it's still my thing. Throw it everywhere. If I enjoy doing it, the people I'm working with are cool. Like, who cares what everybody else thinks about it? Oh, you're not that guy. Oh, eat it. Like, don't yeah. tell me what I am. I'll do whatever I want, and either people are gonna like it or they're not. And, yeah. Throw, 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 see what sticks. It sticks, all right, focus on that a little bit more, you know? Sure. Well, I mean, life's supposed to just be a fun little journey anyways, right? If you're taking it too Preach. seriously, you stop enjoying the whole time. And if you actually are just enjoying something in the moment, there's no reason why you can't do it. You look at, like, there's so many people who have completely transitioned their, like, career paths to do totally different things, right? Like, look at Jessica sure. Alba as, an, as a, a great example. She's made so much more money and had so much more success after acting. Oh, yeah. And everyone just assumed that's all she could do. And I'm sure she's loving everything she's doing, you know what I mean? And, <laughs> yeah. But there's no reason why she can't do that. And no. that's that you've seen that, you know, Jay-Z, you've seen it with a lot of people. Anyways.
I'm excited to like go through and see, or I should say, listen to all the different stuff that you've made. Like listen to like the hip hop, like <laughs> looking at you in person and being like, so you did hip hop and you did this and I'm obviously pop stuff. Like I'm just excited to kind of like go through the discography <laughs> and be like, who is this dude that I just hung out with? It's, um, it's funny you say that because you asked me before about my name yeah. and that's actually why. So Santino, the misfit now, like I, even that, even that song, uh, which is Scarlett Carson is the band, but we added, um, my name and my guitarist's name to it as credits as well oh, sure. so that when you go through my discography on like you know uh on spotify and all like you know these different songs show up and same with the the you know movie soundtrack and all and, I'm, and i think like what people must think listening to like this song to the next song to the next song like what the the hell is going on right now yeah dude yeah. well i mean even through the show like i said you, you do different things like for me i own a skateboard job right so like that's what most people think about me as and then last night i was interviewing caitlin o'connor who is like a TV host and does stuff with like Maxim. Like she was, she basically just like this model who does, who interviews people. Sure. And I'm like, so wait a second, this dude who owns a skateboard shop in Eau Claire is also the same guy out in LA interviewing models and stuff. I'm like what? Yep. How is that the yep. same person? It's like, well, I don't know. I like a lot of different things. <laughs> yeah. So getting into like different things that you like, you moved out here at some point. Um, I, I guess we should talk quick about that, but then I want to get into the, the movie thing, yep. you know, getting into that. So how, what was the move like? here let's get into that first and then we'll get to the movie stuff. so actually one feeds into the other uh, Perfect. pretty pretty seamlessly is uh when i moved to uh new york um before that i had so because of all these different music projects i had been you know you usually shoot music videos with them and then with the advent of uh of digital um you know the digital camera technology and stuff with the reds and all it be, it was starting to become easier to shoot actual music videos without massive budgets so you didn't you know that didn't look like garbage um, and I'm super picky about the aesthetics of things. Like I started out my, the, my first job, I did graphic design and stuff. I was building websites for people when I was like 10. Like oh, that's okay. how I started, I started on like Adobe Photoshop and all that, like before anybody knew what the hell Adobe was. Um, and, uh, so I've always been really picky about the way things look. And then I found this, uh, director when I was doing Scarlet, uh, named Scott Hansen. Uh, we, we shot our first music video. And then when I went solo and I was in New York, I started shooting more music videos with him. I had done, a maybe two or three, one out here actually in LA, um, called Feeling Good, and then uh, I shot a video called Break Me Down in New York City and all. And um, and then I, th through playing shows in New York, met another videographer, this guy, uh, Walmy De La Cruz, shout Walmy. Um, and uh, we started shooting music videos together out there. So now I'm around this equipment and around this like kind of being on our own little mini indie gorilla sets. Sure. And uh, and I'm directing a bunch of them and kind of storyboarding them. And uh, I started editing a bunch of them. I, I had already kind of had some experience with all of this. And um, through so, so through the music is how I ended up getting even heavier into I guess my foray into filmmaking. Which, to be fair, I kind of kind of jumped from one from one thing to another as I as I seemed as it seems to be a theme in my life. But um, yeah, I uh, was so I was doing um, doing the music videos, doing the hip hop thing in New York. Did some really cool shows. Uh, was flying around. I did a play with MGK down in on a was it South Padre Island um, for spring break. I played with Redman, which is one of my favorites. He was uh, one of the hosts, him and Fishbone, over at um, La Poisson Rouge in New York City, and some cool stuff. And I'm like, oh wow, like all right, I've kind of starting to do this again, like I had done with the band, where I'm. Starting this was to when you're doing the solo hip hop when I was stuff doing with the them. Okay, yeah, cool. Santino. I think I was under Santino Noir, and I did the. Um, uh, the housewife uh, with Melissa yeah. and all the video and all and um, yeah, so I, I, I'm kind of wasn't. I was just I'm gonna do music. I'm gonna do music. I'm gonna yeah. do music. And then I decided I wanted to move to Los Angeles. I've been talking about it forever. We were far enough away from the stuff that had happened that was keeping me closer to home, uh, and it just felt like the right time. I just I had, so I started coming out here um, for like a month at a clip, uh, staying at an Airbnb or crashing with friends or you know however I could get myself into Los Angeles for some you know, chunk of time to kind of get a feel for everything. So I'd only been out here maybe once or twice before that. Um, yeah, and then I, 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 I fell in love with it. I mean, it's way dirtier than I thought it would be, it, as, yeah. it, as everyone <laughs> finds out immediately. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it's shiftier and it's all the, all the good things and all the bad things you expect LA to be. It is. And it's not, it, and it doesn't hide it. Like uh, your 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 opening of this uh, of this podcast about walking on a dirty street and into a really nice hotel, I think is LA in a nutshell. Um, it's just kind of its odd uh, dichotomy of things that should not be this close to each other in proximity, and yet literally are everywhere you go here. Um, 
and, and, and it's great. It's kind of the magic of it, you know? So anyway, I uh, started shooting music videos and my whole life, this is just a quick rewind, is my whole life, my pops, uh, my father, Joe Campanelli, um, has always, to, you know, always told me when he was growing up, he used to live out here. Him and my mom both used to live out in LA and he wanted to be a filmmaker. He even went to film school and did all that. Um, but he just kind of never got, a, you know, got around to it. He had kids and got married and started his own uh, company, which he's very successful with. And he does, you know, he does really, really cool stuff. But he had always wanted to make movies. Um, and I, going back to me being incredibly arrogant, I guess, I, uh, I, I kept saying, I was like, hey, I, Scott Hansen, this producer I know that I'd worked with, the director, um, in my first couple of videos, he started making movies. And I started kind of talking to him, like, what was your process? And I'm like, oh, like, this isn't as insane. I mean, I know it's insane, but it's not as insane as I thought it would be. This sounds maybe kind of feasible. Like, I've jumped into all these other crazy things that I didn't know anything about, and I managed to kind of pull them off. And uh, why not this? Like, he's always been so, my father's always been so incredibly supportive of what I was doing, but my, my whole family has. And um, I wanted to do this with him. I was like, he had he's had a bunch of great ideas, but there was one that felt... Um, realistically, like, accomplishable at our very, very amateur level. Like, hey, maybe we can pull this off. And that was, uh, and that was Bully. And uh, so what I, right after I moved out here, um, we started talking about it. And I was, I don't know if it was the LA Air or what, but I was like, yeah, I, I can do this. I can direct a feature film and produce it. <laughs> like, I had never even shot a short film. I had done music videos, and that was it. I had never shot uh, an actual narrative in my life. Um, and then uh, fast forward a year into being in LA and I'm, I'm back in New Jersey <laughs> on, on, on a set and we're, and we're shooting bully. Um, yeah. So what's, what's just the quick uh, sales pitch of what is bully? Why would people watch it? Like what's it about and stuff? Absolutely. Um, so bully is a coming of age kind of dark comedy about a kid, uh, a character named Jimmy, played by uh, Tucker Albrezi, who's actually in, um, you can find him in the show, Mr. Iglesias on Netflix, and he's been the voice, he's on Paranorman and everything, really, really good kid. Um, I say kid, now he's a grown man, but uh, when we shot it, he was a kid. Anyway, so uh, he gets, he's getting bullied, he's getting picked on in school, and it's very like Karate Kid-esque, where um, he's gets his, you know, handed to him on the front lawn of this old boxer's house. Sure. And the guy comes out and breaks up the fight. And the, the, uh, Mr. Action Jackson is played by Ron Canada, who's another guy you've seen a million times. He's been in everything. He was the judge in, uh, t in, in Ted 2, the overrule. And that guy, you've <laughs> seen him a million times. He is, he is, he's incredible. Ron, Ron was incredible. I'll, 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 I'll I digress. But um, anyway, so he helps him out and he brings him to, um, he goes, look, I'll, I'll help you learn how to defend yourself. And he brings him to a boxing gym run by a character named Manny, played by Danny Trejo, who uh, if you've seen any movie ever, you've seen Danny because yeah. he's in everything. Um, and uh, and he learns how to defend himself and that was it. And it's kind of based on, uh, I was uh, I was picked on and bullied a lot for being heavy when I was a kid. My dad was picked on and bullied when he was younger. There's a few names we may have used, uh, you know, from our ch collective uh, childhood upbringings. Sure. And, um, and yeah, uh, and it's available, uh, might as well plug it. It's available on, um, I think it's on Amazon and Vudu and Fandango, if that's even still a thing. It's everywhere and on sure. uh, uh, in demand and all. But And we did the uh, premiere at the Chinese Theater, which is about, what, f five blocks yeah, away from where we're sitting close. right now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which that was, that was always a goal, too. Was the, I, It wasn't in the main theater. It was in the, the large theater upstairs, not the IMAX one. Sure. That's that's the next goal is, is a premiere sure. there. Uh, um, you know, red carpet on the street, the whole thing. That's the next goal. But, um, but yeah, and we did the uh, dances with films, big film festival. Did a bunch of festivals, won some awards, won the industry choice award there at the, Ch uh, at the Chinese, which was amazing. Um, yeah, and it was it, it was just it's been weird. It's been weird, kind of going from music to music videos for the music because it was just like a supplementary thing, and now I'm questioning how like I, I pretty regularly i mean as recently as last night i'm sitting down reading story by robert mckee because i want to um i'm, I'm writing a, a, another screenplay and so is my pops and we're reworking and i want to get better at this craft now and i'm starting to think that that supplementary thing is 
taking over the main thing a little bit. Like I, maybe I want to be primarily a filmmaker that also does music. Sure. But I, I can't tell because then sometimes I'm like, I want to get on stage. So that's why yeah. <laughs> before I'm like, I'm just going to do everything, you yeah. know, but my mind can't can't seem to focus on one or the other. Sure. But yeah. I mean, that's okay. You know, like, uh, yeah, it's, it's okay to have different chapters throughout your life, right? Like sure. whatever you're really into at that particular time, like there's nobody, it's your life, right? It's really nobody else's. I know we do a lot of things like with, uh, not necessarily on purpose, but we do a lot of things to gain the attention of, the, of other people, whether sure. it's like our friends, our family, our loved ones or whatever, because that's what feels good. You want that recognition and whatever. But really when it's all said and done, they don't care that much. It's you that you need yeah. to worry about whether or not you actually want to do that. So if what you want to do for the next five years, 10 years is directing. And then all of a sudden, maybe in 20 years, you're like, God, I just want to scream. Like so, you could do that. So here's the thing, right? Here's the thing. I am trying to live about five to 10 different chapters in the same chapter. And that's where it does become a little bit of an issue, but I agree with you. Yeah. And that's where my life has kind of been that up to this point where it was like, well, I'm doing this genre with this project and this genre now with this project. And then for a couple years, I focused on the film and then uh, the whole world ended with the apocalypse and I started going back into some of the solo stuff and now we're where we are now and it's like, all right, now we can get back on set, it looks like. We'll start sure. making the next movie. But at the same time, I'm trying to do like, you know, four or five other things. Um, but uh, to your point before about the way, the reason we do these things and I, what's the best way to say this? I... Perspective, right? Perspective is everything. So the way that you look at it, of because I'll get in my head about it, like almost every creative does, like, oh, should I be focusing on this? Should I do it this way? Should I do it that way? Should I be doing this genre or this project or this medium or whatever? And it just kind of comes down to like, well, all right, right now, this is where my brain's at and this is what I can focus on and what's making me happy in this moment. And it's just, if I can continuously remind myself to keep that perspective, like, what am I enjoying right now? What keeps me grounded? What's making me feel fulfilled? Whatever that thing is, don't worry about the rest of it, the commercial aspects of it, the, the viability of succeeding in a certain project, or whether or not you've even done it before, because as I've shown, it can be done even if you don't really know, um, just with a lot of, uh, we'll call it moxie, and, and a lot of really good, talented people around you, of course. Sure. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, honestly, I think the most people build things up to be in their mind a lot bigger than they are, you know? Everything. like Right, that's what I mean. So once you yeah. hop in, if you're really, like, willing to give it your all, I think people will be surprised by how successful it could be in pretty much anything. Just doing the thing. Right. I think, I, I think that is the biggest barrier to entry for all creative outlets. It's just doing it. Most yeah. people, I mean, I, would, I don't even know, I, I want to know the statistic of how many people don't ever try the thing they want to try, and that's the reason they don't know if they're any good at it or not. Right. It's just that. It's just literally, oh, I didn't even attempt it. I, you know, it's like, I didn't even talk to the girl at the bar. So how are you going to know? Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's just, it's just hard for, you know, for people to pull that trigger. I would say also one thing, um, in, in the creative realm, I, I interviewed uh, Gabriel Fisher as like a local artist in my zone. This kid, he's not a kid, whatever. He's not that, that much younger time. than me. Yeah. yeah. Well, because <laughs> when I met him, he was young, but it's yeah. fine. Anyways, super talented artist and no one out here would know who he is, but he, he kills it back home. He's awesome. awesome. And I was talking to him about like painting and he was saying how he you know works on all these different paintings at the same time right like one thing's drying but then one thing's whatever and it, i think it was kind of a cool metaphor to look at like in the creative space in any kind of creative space you're not going to be killing it at everything all the time whatever is feeling good that day is probably where you should spend your energy right yes. so if you can kind of diversify your time like with me i have my show and then i have my shop well then i also have to design merchandise for that but then i also have to create content for this and then i also paint murals and stuff like that it's like whatever's feeling Feeling good and whatever's working for you that day, that's where you can spend your time. Absolutely. So when you have all these different things going on, you have a little bit more leeway. Granted, sometimes you have a, de a deadline deadlines. for this that, or whatever, say, so you have to do that. Yeah, but. deadlines tend to throw a wrench into the into the gears with stuff like that, and that's sure. when it starts to make things that you enjoy, like pr uh, external pressures, uh, even if they're self imposed, um, tend to make. That, that seems to be the first catalyst to, to, to start to build a disdain for something that started yeah. as a passion or a love. And you have to be careful not to fall into that trap because it's a real easy trap to fall into. Yeah. And I think there's another good thing about diversifying um, your creative outlets, yeah. you know, is that you can easily step away from something that may be causing you a bit of grief or a bit of frustration or what have yeah. you. Uh, as you well know, with the, yeah. you know, you a bit like me and the eclecticness of the things that you do. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I find just going with sort of the in the inner flow while trying to stay within the outer flow does that make sense yeah. 
Yeah. Like where well, where you want to go. Right. Well, it's tough when people have something they're really passionate about and they try to dive full in as a career. The problem is, is if it's not like if it's bringing that disdain and they don't have any other kind of outlet. Now, all of a sudden, the only outlet that they had before isn't there now. Yeah. So it becomes a huge problem. Yeah. So it's it, trying to like navigate that is always going to be a struggle for a lot of people. I want to talk about because we're diversifying our like what we're how we're spending our time. You do have a podcast. I do. Right? You already do talk probably more than I do in a regular day, but then also recording. <laughs> so you want to talk about your podcast a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it started as a result of, uh, as as anyone listening to this can tell, I, I can ramble quite a bit. And uh, I found a good friend who can do the same. And uh, he and I didn't get to, uh, we, we didn't get to really hang out a whole lot before the pandemic started, but we had communicated frequently and all that. Uh, my buddy, Dane Alexander, you can call him Dane the Great for short, though. I love that one. Um, but uh, Dane and I, we actually met, we played a show here uh, I at the what used to be Sayers Club. I don't think, I think it closed during the pandemic, but we played a show and I, as soon as he hopped off stage, I was like, oh, who's that? Who's that? Some, some. Like I need to, I need to know him. Like he just had that energy, like yeah. like I do. Like I jump off the stage and get in like the crowd's face and stuff. He was doing the same thing. I don't care how many people are in the room. Like put it, just leave it all out there. And uh, we just hit it off immediately. And we had kept in touch. And this is about a, a year or two after the world ends. And I'm sitting there thinking about all these things I want to talk about and all this. Uh, I'm, we're very political. Um, so there's a lot of things we wanted to talk about in that in that space. So we started doing a couple of songs together that were. Um, super political and as a result of it because we couldn't do shows and i didn't want to do like one of these live performance broadcasts because especially this was pretty early like maybe like six months into everything people hadn't really quite nailed that down yet yeah, yeah. they tend to sound a little janky and i'm not a big fan of it so um we were talking about what can we do so we started doing a live video just he, him and i like him at home me at home video screens literally just stream it and pour a drink and just start talking about like it was kind of a vehicle to promote the music we were putting out but um we just started talking about what was ever you know whatever was going on in the world at the time and the things that we were working on how we were handling everything going on with the pandemic um but with a lot of uh profanity and and and, go <laughs> and goofiness and laughing and drinking and, and the right. whole thing and we did that for about three or four episodes before we started bringing other people into the craziness and then we started having guests and uh our next episode is actually our 50th um, which is we're going to do in person. Well, we've only done two shows in person. Actually. Oh, okay. I've spent more time with Dane on screen than I have in, in real life, which is crazy because there's about 50 plus hours of us at sure. least on, on, on air. Um, but we started bringing in other like creatives and stuff. And, you know, from uh, the whole line we were using for a while was from porn stars to politics. Like we just kind of covered the gamut. And it was it's just an outlet for creatives who have an opinion. Sure. about the things going on in the world and can you want to come talk about it because a lot of people shy away from it they want to talk about something specific and that's and that's fair enough and we are not shy <laughs> yeah so and then a few drinks loosens the tongue a bit and everyone gets you know gets to it and um yeah so it's, it's called failure made monsters um and that which started as the music project failure made monsters just kind of took on its own life as the as the podcast and a, li a live video podcast because it's always yeah, we we like the extra bit of danger to it, where we can't edit it in post, can't fix it in post, man. You said it, you're in trouble for a very long time. Yeah, so. no. Well, I need to come on that number one. But oh, yeah, also, absolutely. Come on, also, we gotta make that happen. Um, one thing that I love about it, I was I forget who I was talking to about this now, which is unfortunate. But anyways, we we're talking about like influencers and stuff, and we we're, we're talking about um, relatively famous people, right? When you have a following, when you have a fan base, yeah. Something like a podcast is such a unique way to do an interview because typically in a magazine or something else like it's pretty thought out exactly how you're going to respond to something and there's only a dozen questions or whatever it's like very straightforward it feels more and you, yeah and you and you can't hear the person's voice or anything something like a long-form conversation in a podcast way people who follow you and like want to see the things you're doing this is the easiest way for them to really connect with who you are as a real person. Yeah. They hear your inflection in your tone. Like you can't cover who you are that well. Yeah. You can only act so much. And over an hour and a half, and especially if you're drinking or oh, whatever, it comes you, out. Man. Who you are is yeah. coming out, and that's yeah. who that's who these people want to hear, Absolutely. right? Because that's why they're following you in the first place. Absolutely, you know, and they appreciate your music and everything else you're doing, but they want to support you as a person. So by doing more of those types of things and being open to like not curating yourself in a certain way, but being open in that kind of way. I think people 
really do appreciate it. I, I'm, look, I'm a massive advocate for it, and I think I think one of the biggest issues, not to get political on, on sure. your show, but I think one of the biggest issues that we have in this country is a lack of communication. Oh, it's absolutely. not, everyone's talking at each other, but no one's talking to each other. Like a lot of people that I'm very close to, I, I disagree with vehemently on a, a myriad of topics, especially across the political spectrum. I and, and we get into it. We get into it, into it. And if a few drinks are going, we're out. We'll be those. We'll be those crazy people in the back corner at the table till like you know, ten or eleven at, at like an Italian restaurant, yelling and stuff, and doing more drinks. You know. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I think I think people want to hear. Um, like what you're about, the way you're saying, but it is a double-edged sword because some people don't. Some people, it's like the 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 shut up and dribble types and whatnot, which I I don't understand. Sure, but I'm not shy about who I am with through my art already. So it's n- no one's surprised when they hear me talking on the show most sure. of the time. I think the stuff people get more surprised by is actually like I'm like a huge anime nerd and stuff oh, like sick. that. Big yeah. otaku. Yeah, we were talking about Japanese. Uh, yeah. We both went to Japan before and absolutely love Tokyo. Oh, so it's the best place on earth. Yeah. And, yeah, and then yeah. like I'm into I'm into VR and video games and all this sure. stuff. I don't think people would take that away from me uh, from meeting me in like a, you know in this or in even in this interview. Sure. Um, or any of the things that they you know know me for. So. I think that's been more where the surprises have come from and the real me coming through is me just being yeah. a big nerd. Sure, um, sure. But uh, yeah, I mean, I I agree. I, I think, uh, and you've got a you've got a great thing here with what you're doing with this show. I appreciate I that. love the topic. You know what I mean? I love yeah. I love the the core of what you're doing with this because you're bringing out people. What better way to make have have a passionate conversation than by talking to someone about their passions? Quite specifically, I get people. I'll get. I'll get the energy out of somebody, yeah. but it might not be necessarily a positive energy. It's a frustration or an anger or fear or whatever. But uh, this is something where you go like, "Hey, no, yeah, like I love talking about this thing. I've dedicated much of my time to it. Let's go." You know, it's it's, it's really hard to get bored listening to somebody talk about something they're passionate about. Sure. It really is because of the, the their energy is infectious. Yeah, and you're like, I've never thought about this topic like this, but now I'm excited about it. You know what I mean? It's like any good movie. You watch yeah. a good movie about like boxing, and all of a sudden you're like, maybe I should start boxing when you didn't Which, care to box in the first place. By the place. way, www.bully.movie. Sorry. Yeah, there you go. No, we, I, I definitely really want to check the movie out after this. So, anyways. I imagine your music taste itself has got to be really all over the place too. Like I, you know, when they do the Spotify end of the years, yeah. I'd love to see where yours, it's, what yours is. It's all over the place, man. And um, I, from metal to hip hop to, um, I'm, I'm a huge fan of uh, Sarah McKenzie. She's a jazz pianist and singer. Um, I listen to a lot of like the old crooners and stuff too. Sure. And then I'll jump to like. 12 foot ninja my buddies in uh bad wolves um fire from the gods and then i uh, ra- any rap metal too i love almost all of it um, sure. just like old lincoln park rage against the machine yeah rage um, is my all-time favorite band rage is the jam yeah dude. yeah there's uh, nobody ever like no one's ever sounded like him before no one's ever sounded like him after zach de la roca i know he did a couple like little side projects and stuff after yeah. those run the, the one with run the jewels is still my favorite post that one was crap. sick and then run he the did jewels he, fast. Run oh my god yeah, yeah yeah lp and yeah but but then uh he did the one day as a lion thing. Did yeah. You ever, yeah. That like little EP thing. I was hooked on for a minute too. Yeah. And I feel like hardly anyone's ever heard that, but no, it's not, not common. No, uh, no. And in, unless it, other than the jewel stuff, I don't think anything else he's done is really popped other than with rage. Yeah. Really. Which is crazy because yeah. like of exactly. how big rage was, I know. it's, it's mind blowing that anyone could fade after it's, that. It's crazy. You know, who's, uh, Morello's crushing it though yeah. right now. Yeah, my yeah, my totally. buddy, um, speaking of bands, he's one of my all time favorites, Papa Roach. Yeah. Um, I have a great, stories with those guys man and jacoby's still one of the nicest people i've ever met in the industry hands down no con i say this way too often too at this point it's weird but uh but his, <laughs> bro- his brother bryson's a buddy of mine and he just did um he just directed the new uh it's something with uh tom morello and grandson do you hear that no oh it's awesome tom morello and grandson did a track and tom did a track with the dude uh, with ollie from bring me the horizon too so he's murdering yeah. it right now sure sure and i just want like can you just do one with Zach now, man. Come on. <laughs> Come together. Get over your differences of politics or whatever else is the problem at this <sighs> point and just like do it. Yeah, totally agree. Okay, so uh, now you're back on the you're on the, the directing path. You're still doing a bunch of stuff, right? But yeah. the next big thing you're trying to do is another movie. What, another feature. Yeah, yeah. What what's kind of the plan? Where are you at with it? Can you talk about what can you like, I guess, what can you actually tell us about it? That's a good question. Um, I can. So uh, working title right now is not so wise, guys. 
Um, my father, uh, the stories by him, we're rewriting the, uh, the script as we speak. Um, last time when we did Bully, it was, the story was um, simple. It was an easier, uh, standard, like classical, you know, archetype type story. It's just, you know, kid gets bullied, kid learns how to fight, kid stands up for himself. Very straightforward. Um, and it was just a good feel, good thing. Whereas this one has a, a, a bit more layers, a lot more characters, um, more grand locations, bigger sequences, and a lot of things that um, I want to make sure are all on the page perfectly before we even step on set. I learned I, the shooting the first movie was the best and worst film school of all time. <laughs> it was I'm just sure. full on trial by fire. Um, and and learning everything on uh, w while the world's on fire, but learning everything on set was uh, one of those things where it's. Uh, I I know that I'll come. I came away with so much from it. Yeah. But it, <laughs> I can see how, and, and the reason I don't always recommend, I can see how it could dissuade a lot of people from wanting to do it again. Like it did, it did with my father for a little while. That he was, you know, when he thinks about some of it, it's not always a pleasant memory. And I, and I, 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 I can't say that I enjoyed a lot of it. Even we had, I mean, I could do a whole episode. Uh, we, I, we've joked that the behind the scenes of our movie would be better than the movie. That's how insane <laughs> stuff was. And I'm talking like, like just a just a nugget. The houses before before uh, we started production, right? Uh, Scott. And uh, Desiree, who was our um, our UPM, showed up to get like uh, just kind of situated for our cast and crew and all. And the houses that we were putting everyone up in, we were scammed. They didn't exist. They they existed, and we paid for them. But the people we paid didn't own the houses. Oh no! And so I spent my first night in the middle of like a nor'easter storm in like a tiny police station on like one of the islands outside of, uh, Tom's River, and like uh, I think it was in Island Heights or Seaside uh, Seaside Park or something. And uh, yeah, and that was just like the that was one of like a myriad of like things that we we lost other locations the day before shooting. There was uh, mass food poisoning for one thing on. I mean, all this stuff, crazy stuff, crazy stuff. Um, so like, you know, when you think back to it, you're like, oh God. But I learned so much about kind of what not to do and what to make sure I have ready and, and prepped and, and done uh, and uh, just kind of sorted out before I ever step foot on a set. Um, yeah. As opposed to last time where it was a little bit more fly by the seat of your pants and stuff. Um, so yeah, so we're, we're working on the screenplay right now and uh, hopefully if things, uh, continue to go the way that they're going, um, we'll be able to, you know, be on a set again and, and get into uh, pre-production next year. Are you, do you have to, did you have to get a bunch of funding from some outside source since this is going to be a bigger film or are you guys kind of like. The new like, one, yes. The new one, yeah. The last one we were able to do uh, on a very mod, what, what most large films probably pay for catering or something. Sure. Like, yeah, sure. Um, so we, we did all right on the last one, but this time around I'm, and that's the thing is trying to figure out because the other the, the other big element that after the fact um, of doing bully that I didn't learn because for most people don't know this when you make a movie there's the, everything that leads up to making the movie right but like the actual act of making the movie was like two and a half weeks or something that sure. was it it was I think sixteen days or fourteen days or something we were on set and a pickup date like a month later that was it but there was the year that preceded it of planning and the and the never mind all the time it took to write the script but then there's all the post. Um, and editing and sound and music and then the festival run and then when you finally get around to marketing and releasing it and then learning what the distribution's like and how does that work and how, where can you make the money and how do you market it to, to try and make the profit after they take their cut and blah, blah, blah. All this extra crap that just doesn't even compute when you're like, hey, let's make a movie, you right. know? So now I'm trying to take all that into consideration this time around. Something I would never do with like music where I just make what I want to make and see what happens. Um, but with this, it's like there's so much money out the gate that you need a viable outlet, you know, like a viable way to try and recoup at minimum your, your costs. Well, yeah. And you have so many other people that are depending on it too. Uh, yeah. So it's okay. kind of like, you can't be quite as reckless when you have other people's livelihood. When it's just yourself, you're yeah. like, well, eh, if I get screwed, then I get screwed and yeah. I'll deal with it. But when it's other people now, all of a sudden you're empathetic and you're like, well, I need to do what's right by these other people. So thankfully you got that crash course in the hardest way possible because that really <laughs> is the fastest way to learn. Like yes. by far, it's the fastest way to learn. You don't, it's, I always tell people it's nice to make the mistakes early 
Because if you make them earlier, like then you, you don't hopefully avoid them. Yeah, you can avoid it when it's a much bigger problem. Yeah, you know what I mean. And I've had that happen with the show with losing files and different things. And now, oh, like yeah, when yeah. things have popped up, it's like, oh, I know how to handle it, no big deal. And I haven't had any significant issues happen. The only time I ever lost an episode was with my cousin in the first season, where I was like, <laughs> oh, we just re-record this tomorrow. Like yeah, it really yeah. wasn't a big deal. You know what I mean? So moving forward, where what? I mean, obviously you're doing the movie, right? Like that's the big thing that you're spending time on. How else are you going to be spending your time in the next say three six months? Are you going to go back? to japan and go read a bunch of anime go to akihabara God, like, i mean I what do you like how are you kind of spending first of all akihabara time? right now like let's just drop let's everything get the Mario turn, Karts. turn off the mic we're going <laughs> um no i um i don't know how much travel we'll be doing until things loosen up a bit more right. we, we did once we went to mexico which was great but um no i'm uh working on music honestly a lot and trying to get this film down so I've, i'm gonna try and take as much of this time as possible to like i said before get everything onto the page for the film um in a way that makes me feel confident enough to walk in with these, you know, with a bigger budget and all these people, you know, that type of thing. And, but the rest of it is is music. Um, Dane and I have worked on a bunch of new tracks. Uh, I've been, um, I started, so during the pandemic, I had always kind of dabbled with producing, uh, but during the pandemic, I started making my own instrumentals like from scratch again and then using a lot of samples. And then once I started digging into the samples, I was like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna really go to town with this, and I, I've had I've had a lot of fun, and I'm um, I'm hoping to maybe even put out a full album or an EP of mostly stuff I've done, top to bottom, tracked, mixed, mastered, produced, did the whole thing, and obviously wrote and performed on. Um, so that's been a lot of that, and then the podcast we're doing, and um, and trying to uh, figure out what what. I want to focus the majority of my time on once I've gotten this out of my system and put the music out there and stuff. Cause I'll always do music when, when the, you know, that surge hits me and I'm like, oh, all right, I got, I just have to write a bunch of crap right now. And cause yeah. it usually comes in like a wave of like a week or two or something, or maybe a month if I'm lucky and I'll just write a whole mess of music and then it'll come in little blips here and there. And then maybe I'll go a year where it's like, it just doesn't happen the same way. That little jolt doesn't come. Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to figure out what I want to really because like when you're in a band and you're touring or you're writing albums and you're doing the whole thing, like you, it's like work-ish where you're focused. You're going, all right, well, even if I'm not feeling inspired right now, like I'm going to go to rehearsal and we're going to plan these shows and I'm going to play the stuff that's already been written and we're going to market it and, you know, do all that, uh, that whole thing. But right now, since I'm not as focused on the music as a career, like as a money-making career, um, I think I'm gonna try and get better at the entire art of filmmaking and, and all the things that kind of encompass it, which fortunately also includes music. It's one of the best parts about making the movie was uh, we got uh, me and PJ9K, a guitar player I've worked with for years, um, got to do the entire, you know, all the music that accompanied the film. Um, so being able to, and then I did the marketing materials for a bunch of it too, so I could get to use all these tools and, and, and abilities that I've kind of uh, collated over the years into this weird style of mine and put them into one thing um and then yeah dude a lot of anime uh vr <laughs> i've been super into vr i'm very excited about where that technology is going to yeah um i don't know how i feel yet about meta but that's a whole other conversation sure um and then uh yeah just try and just trying to you know find that next jolt but for something outside of music I think. yeah well that's it right i mean you get to a certain point where you plateau and whatever that is right and that's how i felt with my skateboard shop i hit five years and i'm like okay i felt like i did what i set out to do and it's i don't want to go anywhere and i'm sure it'll still grow in its own way but like i did what i wanted to and now i'm like all right so what how what's the next thing what's my next big goal and that's where then the show popped up right so that's that's it's makes sense when all of a sudden you've done kind of what you wanted to do to a certain degree there's always going to be more to be done but you did, did what you set out to do with music where now all of a sudden you have something like you know making movies where it's like a whole new world now that you can experience and you've spent so much time just in the music realm where it's like there's all this freshness you know what I mean? Yeah. To be able to try to accomplish. And the learning curve is so fast now because versus like with music, when you, you know, it's a quick curve, you hold it for a while and then it starts to plateau and you learn a little bit more over time and it's kind of slow. But whenever you pick up something brand new, yes, it's difficult, but it is exciting in its own kind of way. The other thing too, though, is now you say the learning curve is fast, but so is the change. The, the like you can look, I've learned things like a couple of years ago that are like useless already, you yeah. know, because of the evolving technology or the platforms like, uh, 
you know, like uh, mar marketing is probably a, a, a perfect example of this. Like just over the pandemic, the style of marketing we're using for things has changed. The platforms we're using are shifting in certain ways. Like TikTok completely changed the way people are marketing even on other platforms. Like this more UGC, uh, uh, user generated style content um, has become far more prevalent than it was before. Whereas like Polish and the more like Harmon Brothers style commercials like Poopery and all that, you know, yeah. those were those were the thing. And now it's like, oh, it needs to look real. And I'm like, dude, I, like, I just figured this one thing out like a year <laughs> ago and I got to change the whole thing. And, and, and Facebook changes their, the back end of how their ads work and all that. And that's just one example of just, just marketing, never mind for music and like, what gear are you using? And like, I bought this thing and it cost this much money two years ago. And now it's basically obsolete. And you're like, all right, move on to the next thing. Dude, I'm just trying to figure that out with social media. Instagram itself has like evolved so often that oh, it's it, trying to like figure out how to keep interaction with how it works. And it's, it's just like, like it's a game that constantly changes and that's just one random small part of what I do. So I know what you mean. It's yeah. just, it's this constant, constant thing, but at least it keeps it interesting. It, it sure does. <laughs> so <laughs> I was asked this at the end of the show, uh, the same, same two questions. Cause sure. they're my favorite ones. Yeah. Um, the first one is, can you please share a, a story of a, a unique experience that you had something you're really grateful for, but it only happened because you chose to pursue your passions. Um, yeah, I, it's, it's, it's kind of a splintered thing, but, um, Almost everyone I'm like that I consider like that I'm not blood related to, but that I consider family, even down to my wife. I would not know any of them if I hadn't been uh, an artist putting myself out there in the world. All my 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 some of my closest friends on the planet I've made music with, I've been in bands with. My wife I met sort of secondarily through my old stage name, meeting somebody in the industry who had a similar stage name, and they knew her when she was living in Dubai. My wife lived in Dubai when I met her, and I met her on Instagram, but it was through <laughs> at someone here in Los Angeles that I met because of what I was doing. Um, almost yeah, almost everybody in my life as a result of it, and some of the, some of the most interesting people I've met, uh, some of the best life experiences I've had have all been because I've just constantly kept pushing and doing and doing something different in a different space. Um, and then I guess just again, to, to shout out to Jacoby from Papa Roach too. Um, he was one of the first dudes I met that I like grew up like watching and being like that, look at this dude. Cause he's singing and doing a hip hop thing. And he's just got this whole style about it. And I was like, this dude's just cool. Like yeah. I just like what he's doing. Cause he did kind of always before it was, it was like him and like what Limp Bizkit and a couple guys who kind of had that, rap rock new metal thing early and then yeah. people gave him a lot of crap for it and then he evolved into a whole other you know guy and they did the uh getting away with murder and all that afterwards and i was like this just they just keep and they're doing it now like they're working with all these great artists like jaris johnson and guys off of tiktok and stuff like they're just constantly adapting 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 but but for someone who's been around as long as he has i remember the first time we ever played with him at starland ballroom uh i Someone walked up to me and said, Jacoby's looking for you. And I, I, I think I talked to him for like five seconds earlier and was like, hey, thank you for, you know, booking sure. us on the show, like having us. And uh, if you want anything from the merch table, like whatever, just please say the word, like whatever we can do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then he was like trying to find me so I could get something from his merch table and stuff like going out of his way to, I'm like, who does that? Yeah. We played with nationals over and he was just always that guy. And then he ended up booking, like, you know, we ended up hanging out afterwards. I've been to a bunch of his shows since. And um, they uh, uh, even asked us that we play direction for him in the AC and all. It was just a lot of really cool stuff as a result, just like good people. And he, he showed me that like, I don't care. You can be the guy on top of everything. You can be that guy and still be, just like we were like humble and, and awesome about it. And, uh, yeah, was, I, I could go on. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try and stop. <laughs> no, it's, it's awesome when you meet people that you're a fan of and then they actually are as cool or cooler than you think they're going to be. Cause a lot of times, unfortunately you build somebody up to be something that they're not. I've which, had that plenty of times. Yeah. Too. And it's, it's really not even their fault half the time. It's no, just, you're just putting them to a standard. Well, or, that, and yeah. you're, you're just holding them to the standard. You're putting them on a pedestal. Sure. That's like so hard for somebody to actually be yeah. that it's just, it's almost unfair to them. Plus, yeah, they gotta, they gotta try to put that face on all the time. But when you meet people, 
like that, those like that can kind of totally change the game for you. And I've had a few experiences like that too, where I've met people that I really respected. Like as a, a quick example, Steve Nesser uh, was pro for Tony Hawk's company Birdhouse for a long time. He's sure. a pro skateboarder, yeah, yeah. right? And he's like the biggest, most prevalent skateboarder in Minneapolis area. He owns his own skateboard shop called Familia. His sister actually married uh, Billy Joe from Green Day randomly, huh, no which kidding. is crazy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, so he's a very respected guy within the Minneapolis and specifically the skateboarding culture. When I opened my shop, he drove to my shop just to like hang out for a little bit and say what's up. That's awesome. Which to me was just like the fact that I'm on your radar. And yeah. then he he went out of his way to do that was just really meaningful to me. You know what I mean? That, and it, it sticks that's out. That's exactly, yeah. It's yeah. the exact, it, 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 meaningful is the right way. It's, it's, it's quite a thing to be a fan of the... Uh, the image of somebody, the art, the, you know, the, the, what's the, the avatar yeah. of, of a person, right? The way we are with most things, but then to also very quickly become a fan of that person's character, right? Like a personal character. It's, it's really something because now I'm like, well, you're just awesome top to bottom. And then that becomes that, you know, that I think that's where people become, um, really truly inspiring like yeah i can make art like you but if you're also but if you're a crappy person then like well all right that's not as inspiring but if you do something i appreciate and you are someone i can appreciate and you treat others in a way that i can appreciate well now i want to like i want to really try to like model myself after that and i've only met a handful of people i can say that about yeah but i mean you hang on to those people it's it's really For important dear life, right man. and and that's one thing i think we as anybody that has any kind of following at all and, and again i don't have like a huge mass people follow whatever but even me, just through, me, the, me through the show <laughs> you know and through my shop like there are people that pay attention to things that you do yeah. and for me especially like kids and stuff in my town it's really important for us to recognize the position that we're in where we can inspire other people if we choose to carry ourselves in the right kind of way it doesn't mean you have to be on and have that face all on and be time, that way no. all the time just when you're choosing to be in a position to be around those people yeah. you have to be able to do that um i, I think em empathy is yeah. the key there it's just oh, just always you might not always feel like you said on like to be the character that you portray sometimes but just at least be empathetic to them and vice versa too people have to be that way towards us to understand like hey i'm not always on but i'm yeah. not going to just shun you because i'm not i don't feel like dealing with you or anything like that. yeah it's just, yeah. just rude yeah <laughs> yeah it just comes with the territory of yeah. like what you do when you want to be in front of people so sure. uh i also asked this this is the other question I, I was kind of like alluding to is i think the fastest way to learn anything is through mistakes right which obviously like we were talking about that with the movie where like that was the quickest way for you to learn so maybe this is going to come back to that but can you share a story about a un like a, a unique specific scenario a story about a mistake that you made that taught you something that somebody listening might be able to benefit from yeah yeah uh, i you know it's funny i so i you i knew we were gonna talk about this and i accidentally answered the first version was uh in the beginning of this the, the podcast i was discussing how i interacted with people um that i was working with creatively and i i fortunately learned that lesson since but it really does come down to and again i guess empathy does play a big part in this too is trying to i did not for a long time i was so worried about the goal with the project, with like, I wanted to, like making the art was one thing and you do that with your friends and then, but once that art's done, as you know, you have to, you have to market it and you have to perform it or show it or whatever. You have to share it in some way. Uh, great art can only be recognized as great if people are uh, made aware of it and are able to enjoy it. And the biggest problem I had for a long time was I was so orient, goal oriented and like, all right, well, we got to get this out there and stuff. And I didn't think about um, the way I was interacting with the people I was working with while I was focusing on those goals. I was very kind of like dictatory about it. Um, emphasis on the first syllable of that. <laughs> and uh, I, you know, so it took, it took me a while of, you know, people, different people from different walks of life and different projects echoing similar sentiments, you know, criticisms uh, to me. Some, most, especially when we were younger, not in a constructive way, not in a way that made me think about it, just in a way that made me reactive. And I yeah. didn't, uh, I, you know, so I didn't learn anything from it. I, and like I said, I leaned into it. Um, but now, like when we shot the movie Bully, for instance, um, and, and even working with Scarlett Carson, too, like while things went a little sideways for the reasons, for, for various reasons, um, in the early days of that project, or I say early days, but five, six years in or whatever it was, um, I, you know, I made sure that like I was, I talked to everybody on our crew. I was helping them move gear and stuff. Like I was, I had drinks with our, um, our DP the other day, uh, Andrew Pulaski. Uh, he happened to fly into LA 
and uh, we grabbed a drink and <laughs> we were joking about it. He goes, he'll work with some directors. Like they don't even talk. It's like, you look at their face and they're, that's the answer. You're like, no, you got to do another take and stuff. I'm like, I go, dude, if I'm ever that guy, slap me across that same face. Like, don't let, don't ever let me be that guy. Uh, because I, I, I want to, I want to always remember, and you should always remember if you're listening to this, everybody's just trying to do whatever, you know, makes them happy in whatever form that comes in. Everyone's just trying to, you know, kind of chasing that dragon of feeling fulfilled or feeling good enough or feeling validated or uh, being viewed as successful or what have you. It's just, it's all the same crap. It's all kind of rooted in the same feeling of like, I did this right, you know. So just when you're on, when you're working with people, just remember, like, even though we might all want the same thing, and I understand that there needs to be typically like one one person running the ship, and then everyone else kind of working towards it, and not everyone always understands the um, the hierarchy of things. But don't crap on them because you're so focused on the goal. Like, remember where they're coming from. Try to put yourself in their shoes and be empathetic to like maybe why they're thinking that way or be feeling that way. Or, and 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 listen to them. I, some of the, some cool ideas, uh, you know, stuff in movies, stuff in songs, stuff that happened in studios came from someone who had nothing to do with the project. Or, or at the very least, maybe not the creative element, like, like a grip or something was like, hey, maybe, you, should, you know. I'm not saying that all grips should be telling directors how to make movies. I get that that's not the normal thing, but like, don't always, just because they're not this person, just because you know what you're doing, and maybe you really do, like I, I believe I really do, doesn't mean you should treat anybody cr crappy because of it. Yeah. Just be yeah. good to everybody, listen to everybody, try to take it all in, be understanding, put your foot down when you need to, but just, you know, just be mindful. I think that's the best way to say it. Just be mindful of how you interact with the people you're working with, no matter how tunnel visioned you are so it's real easy to kind of get into that zone and just kind of like well everyone else is there you're all an obstacle now i'll tell you what though if you if you're dismissive of the people around you they're going to be dismissive dismissive of you and yes. everything you're trying to do your goals aren't going to be realized because yes. you're not respecting the people around you so it is it is extremely important um okay well we're at the end of the show i appreciate you coming on um one more time where can people kind of follow the things you know that you do and also how can people best support you they're going to be listening to the show and go okay well this was really rad you know how can they support you now moving forward uh you can go on uh, SantinoTheMisfit.com. Follow me on social media at SantinoTheMisfit. Um, you know, everything, Instagram, all that jazz. Uh, and uh, go watch Bully. Um, go watch Bully so that when we go and start raising money for the next one, it's a little easier because they see all those amazing reviews that you left on Amazon for us. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, go watch Bully. It's on Amazon. Uh, you can also find Bully.movie uh, is the web address. And um and go listen to the soundtrack for that too, which I'm very proud of, and we had a lot of fun making. Um, yeah, I've been saying, just just follow, support, drop me a line, message me. I, I always check my messages. Send me a message. That's how I ended up on this podcast here. And big shout, big shout to uh, to Dave. Um, Madden Hat for for connecting us too. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, Instagram can be a very powerful tool if you use it in the right way. I met and my wife on Instagram, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And support can come in a lot of ways. And I say it at the end of the show a lot of times, but it can come financial in a way where like you can donate to my show. If you go to passionpod.org, there's a way to do that, which is awesome. Somebody donated 15 bucks to me today awesome. where I posted my Instagram stories saying, hey, if anyone wants to support season eight, you know, buy me a beer, you could donate. Someone did. And I was like, hey, sick. Sweet. You know what I mean? So you can donate in a monetary way. Obviously, everything costs money. So that's helpful. But really sharing, writing reviews, those types of things make a bigger difference than I think people realize. Um, they do really matter. So you can always go and do those types of things. You can review the show on Apple Podcasts. You can, you know, you can follow it on Spotify and share it to your Instagram story or whatever. There's a lot of ways to uh, support those things. And then, yeah, go check out the movie.